Hello, this is Kevin Mueller. I am the owner of the Blue Swallow Motel in Tucumcari, New Mexico, along with my wife, Nancy, and you're listening to the Route 66 Podcast. Route 66, Route 66, right along with the Route 66 podcast. For talks with people living and working along the mother road. The main street of America, from Chicago to L.A., bore a heavy, heavy load. Route 66, Route 66. Sometimes historical paths aren't discovered Until they're lost Right along Right along With the Route 66 Podcast Hello and welcome aboard the Route 66 Podcast Where talks with people living and working along the Mother Road I'm your host, Anthony Arno, and I'd like to thank you for joining us here today on our journey. Today, for this and the next episode, we're going blue. Yes, blue. Today's episode featuring Kevin Mueller, who owns the Blue Swallow Motel with his wife in Tucumcari, New Mexico. And the next episode will feature the Blue Whale. We'll be talking with Blaine Davis, whose father built the Blue Whale as a special gift to his wife after retiring as the director of the Tulsa Zoo. I hope you're well during these times of COVID-19. Spoken to many people up and down the road and hoping that once this is all over, you'll be able to land back on your feet, whether you have a business or just you enjoy traveling the road. School for me as a teacher is officially closed for the rest of the academic year, and I'm teaching online, which is a new dimension to learning. Not to mention, I'm currently teaching students during a new marking period that I've never even met before. You know, part of the everyday norm for being out in public with this COVID-19 pandemic is wearing a protective face mask. It's still hard for me to imagine, but a harsh reality of our time. Well, nevertheless, I've seen all types of face masks, from carpentry respirators to winter scarves, until now. Have you seen a Route 66 face mask? I will be giving away a free Route 66 washable face mask to a random podcast listener who shares their earliest memory about the Mother Road with our listeners. All you have to do is simply visit our website, route66podcast.com, and on the right side of the page you will see a Send a Voicemail tab. Record a short 60-second message about your earliest memory of Route 66, and I will randomly select a winner to receive a Route 66 washable face mask. We'll be sharing the responses with my listeners on a future show. Good luck. Listener feedback. Hello to Stefan in Michigan. Stefan wrote me a really nice email about how much he's enjoying the podcast and all the books I've had on this show, authors. He's read them and passed them on to other people, and it is hoped to someday make it out to Arizona along sections of the highway. But he closes his letter by saying, Every time a new podcast episode comes up, it takes me right back to my last trip along the road. And thank you for that. It helps during this time of feeling helpless and gives hope of future travels that I hope to make along Route 66. Stefan, thank you for such kind words. It really means a lot to me. Thank you. I want to remind you also about the website for this podcast, which now has the 30-plus episodes listed in chronological order, traveling from east to west, from Chicago to Santa Monica. In addition, since I'm home, I will also be releasing brief three- to five-minute video promos from various episodes that I've used while giving talks on Route 66. There you'll find video footage of past guests, such as Angel Del Gadillo, as featured in a Super Bowl commercial a few years ago celebrating Route 66 in Chevrolet to the Tattoo Man of Route 66, who was featured in a video by the road crew. So be sure to check out the Route 66 podcast for daily releases. And now, here's the trivia question for today's show. On the last episode of the podcast, I spoke with Dr. Timothy Hickman of Lancaster University in the UK, 
who organized an international conference in the Route 66 town of Dwight, Illinois, to celebrate the Keeley Institute. The Keeley Institute, led by a Civil War surgeon, Dr. Keeley, in the late 19th century, was one of the first treatment centers in the world for addiction treatment. In my talk with Dr. Hickman, Keeley claimed to treat his patients by using flecks of gold. So here's the question. Why was Keeley one of the most popular doctors of all time that nobody has ever heard of, even today? The answer after today's show. When it comes to Route 66 hospitality, names such as Johnny Carr, Ramona Lehman, and Connie Eccles may not be familiar names for the road traveler, unless you're a true roadie. Those are the names behind the Coral Court, the Munger Moss, and the Wagon Wheel. My guest today is no different than those hospitality pioneers. His name is Kevin Mueller, and he's the owner of, without a doubt, the most popular and photographed motel along the route, the Blue Swallow Motel. Please welcome to the Route 66 podcast, Mr. Kevin Mueller. Kevin, how are you doing today? Doing great, Anthony. How are you? Good. I'm so excited to finally set this up with you. We met a few years back during my Western travel along Route 66, and I have such fond memories of talking with you and your wife and just hanging out in the courtyard with both world travelers and locals, which was a great memory. So thank you. Oh, it's our pleasure. It's, uh, it happens every day out here on Route 66. Kevin, what is your earliest memory of Route 66? Well, uh, it's as a young lad, uh, my dad grew up in St. Louis, so my grandparents lived there, and we would go to visit. Obviously, that's one of the key cities along the route. Uh, he had cousins that lived in Joplin, and this was in the day, late 60s, early 70s, when Route 66 was still... Uh, partly drivable as the main highway, and I and the interstate was being constructed. And we'd go to visit sometimes the cousins in Joplin driving across Missouri, and uh, those are the first remembrances I have of traveling on Route 66. And in later years, I remember my parents um, kind of going back and doing a Route 66 road trip, and I really hadn't given it much thought in between all that time until they started doing it, sharing photos of their trip. And I said, boy, that would be fun to do. And finally, my wife and I and our youngest son, when he got his driver's permit in 2007, decided to take a road trip during his spring break that year. And we drove a good part of the route, not all the way to California, but from Michigan, our home. We hit Route 66 about um, Joliet, and uh, got as far as about Ash Fork, Arizona, before we had to turn back. But we had a blast. And how many years were you in Michigan before you came down to New Mexico? Well, we're, my wife and I both born and raised in Michigan. And uh, after college graduation, we moved um, away uh, for careers and through corporate moves and um, things like that. We've moved pretty much all around the country. Uh, we'd lived in Colorado, Utah, California, uh, back to Michigan, and then traveled around the Midwest, always with corporate moves over a 27-year corporate career before uh, that came to a sudden end, and we decided, after a lot of soul-searching, to look for a business to buy on Route 66. And what was your corporate career like? Uh, Well, I enjoyed my career immensely. A good part of that time was with the Valvoline Company, where I ended up as a regional manager uh, in Michigan and Ohio. Uh, It was it was hectic, busy, exciting. Uh, You know, even though we were the part, my part of the company was involved with customer service. We weren't renting motel rooms or. Uh, slinging hash on Route 66. It was all about customer. It was all about customer service, and I learned a lot about that uh, through that career. And had you heard of the Blue Swallow Motel while you were up in Michigan? I had I had never heard of it until um, 
we were taking that 2007 trip, and we purchased a copy of Jerry McClanahan's Easy 66 guidebook in order to make that trip and started looking at places where we might visit, stop, whatever. Our plan actually was to camp on that trip. It was late March, early April of 2007. The weather turned out to be so bad that we ended up staying in motels most of the time. I think we camped one night out of nine nights on the road because we had snow and miserable weather. That was the first time that I actually saw the blue swallow. We had stayed at a place in McLean, Texas, the Cactus Court, uh, Cactus, the Cactus Motel in McLean, and uh, we were driving all the way to Gallup that day and passing through Tucumcari, saw the Blue Swallow Motel, which wasn't open at that time. The previous owner uh, would operate seasonally. Honestly, it didn't look that good, and my wife wasn't really that impressed at the time. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, I was excited. I thought the architecture was cool. You know, we read the little story about it in Jerry's book, and uh, and then we went on. We we had a a really good time on that trip, and uh, it really kind of sparked the interest in me that wouldn't it be fun to be out here and live and work on the route. And what drew you to a hospitality type of business as opposed to maybe a service or a gift shop type business? Well, I was trying to convince my wife, Nancy, to open a pizza place. And that was, even though we came to look at the motel, we actually were going to look at another building in Tucumcari that was available for sale at a reasonable price. I thought it would make a great pizza joint, and there wasn't one in Tucumcari at that time. And my wife makes a really good homemade pizza. Some of our (laughs) family all can uh, vouch for that. And uh, but she didn't want anything to do with with the restaurant business and making pizzas professional. She she wanted to keep that amateur. uh, And really, honestly, when we came to Tucumcari, we had trouble connecting with the owner of that building. We spent our first night here and fell in love with the place, and we really never looked at anything else. Wow, what a great story. What a great story, Kevin. So how were you able to convince the seller of the Blue Swallow that you were seriously interested in buying the motel when you had a corporate background in sales? <laughs> well, he, he, he was skeptical um, when I contacted him. Uh, he would not been having a lot of success in the sale. And uh, I think he was a little bit frustrated by that. And when this Yahoo from (laughs) Michigan called, (laughs) uh, you know, all gung ho and excited, he was. The first thing he said to me was, "I said I heard the blue swallows for sale," and he said, "It's not for sale." Oh, okay. (laughs) Well, I found it online, and it it said it was for sale, but he said, "Well, it was, but it's not anymore." Okay. Well, um, if you decide to sell. Uh, let me know. We're looking at a career change, and and uh, this looks like it's right up our alley. And um, so we didn't hear from him for a few days, and I so I called him again, and we kept calling him, uh, becoming sort of a nuisance, I'm sure. And he was continued to be skeptical. And one day I said, you know, I don't know what I need to do to convince you that we're serious and that we're the kind of people that would really do this and do it well. Um, but I, I had the idea, are you, I said, are you on Facebook? He said, yeah. I said, well, why don't you go to my Facebook page, do a friend request, I'll become your friend on Facebook. You can look at pictures of our family, our interests, <laughs> pictures of our Route 66 trip. You can see what we're all about, and that may change your mind. Well, he did that later that day, and from that point on, he started bugging us. <laughs> oh, okay. What an incredible story. We were, to, we were able to arrange a visit with him. Uh, first thing, I was unemployed. Um, both of us were unemployed, and we had some sense of urgency. To, we wanted to find out if this was something that could work for us, and uh, we were anxious to get out here. He said, well, we're not open. We won't be open until the end of March. Uh, why don't you plan to come out in May or June, and uh, we'll kind of show you the ropes, and 
I, I said, we can't wait until then. Uh, we need to know if this is going to work. We're going to be broke by by then. We had a child in college. You know, we had those expenses. We had a big house and a big house payment. And we weren't sure how we were going to make it, but we wanted to find out whether this was a possibility for us. And finally, he, he after a, several more calls, he said, well, you know, the last day of March, we agreed to let some people stay here who are on their way back east from Santa Fe. They're spending the night, so I guess you guys can come then, too. So uh, we drove out. We planned to take two weeks to do Route 66 all the way out here. And as long as it took to be here, we were going to do that. And we ended up taking five days negotiating with the owner morning, noon, and night. And we before we left we had a signed agreement to buy the place. And how old were you at the time, Kevin? Oh, well, let's see. That was um, nine years ago, so I guess I was uh, in my late 40s, shall we say. About preparing for retirement, but you purchased one of the most popular motels on the highway. Good for you. Yeah, we, we called it forced early retirement, um, and we enjoyed... We were very excited after that uh, and really looking forward to getting back out here, but we had a lot to do in between to prepare for that. Uh, it it was a bit of a uh, kind of catching our breath and recovering and, and getting ready to, to take this on. We really had no idea what we were in for because we did not know that it was the most popular place on Route 66. We did not know. Really? We knew it was. We knew it was a cool place, and we loved the architecture of it and the history of it. We just didn't know that it had the worldwide draw and and, and just out and out love uh, from uh, around the world. We did not expect that. And what was the condition like back then when you took it over? Well, it was operating, and the rooms were being kept clean. Um, but it was a bit run down, and it needed a lot of work. And the longer we were here, the more we realized uh, how much work it needed. Um, it had been painted badly in an unauthentic color. We wanted to turn it back in time so that it looked more the way that it would have looked in its heyday in the 40s and 50s. Uh, we wanted to make some changes to the rooms to backdate them more so that they appeared more authentic to the, the period. And uh, so that's kind of the way we attacked it. Uh, we wanted it to just as much as possible to be as authentic an immersion in the past as we possibly could while upgrading the comforts, uh, providing the amenities that people expect, like decent Wi-Fi and television and um, really comfortable mattresses and bedding and things, but the the atmosphere, we wanted it to be as authentic as we could practically make it. What are some of the major changes that you and Nancy did to the Blue Swallow in the past nine years? <laughs> well, um, we have rebuilt a lot of the structure underneath the Blue Swallow. A, a lot of the improvements that we've made are under the floors, um, after almost 80 years of use by travelers day in and day out, uh, water leaking, um, you know, just just the wear and tear of weather and people. Uh, we had floor joists that were rotted and collapsing, and we had ceilings that were falling down, and so we we. we we took some pretty aggressive steps in always being cognizant and trying to preserve as much as we could of what was original. We pulled up floors, rebuilt structure, replaced plumbing, probably 90% of the old galvanized pipe and almost everything that was in the ground is now uh, modern PEX. Um, we have great water pressure. We have ta all tankless water heaters, which are efficient. We never run out of hot water anymore. We put a new roof on the place. That was almost sixty thousand dollars. Without it, without a good, we knew the roof was bad when we bought the place. We didn't know how bad it was um, really until the roofers started working. And one guy 
actually fell through Ooh. into one of the <laughs> So uh, we were glad that we did that <laughs> without a good roof over your head. You know, the, everything else that you would do, um, you know, can kind of be for naught. So we really feel like you, you wouldn't necessarily know it by opening the door and looking at the room. The room would look... Uh, We'd like to say that it's kind of like a museum exhibit, except one that it's okay to touch and feel everything. But the important thing is the behind the walls and under the floors and over your head, the structure is sound and preserved and um, will last for many years to come. We feel a real strong sense of responsibility because of the following that this place has to make sure that it's in good shape for the future. Kevin, tell my listeners a little bit about the character of the Blue Swallow. Well, it's very unique. Uh, it's, and it's, part of it is the structure itself, uh, the soft coral colored walls, uh, the, the blue garage doors, the white awnings, the stepped parapet, it's architectural neon, which um, provides a warm glow at night. So you have this unique looking building, which is uh, the motor court style accommodation. Every room has a garage attached to it. And that that is great. People really enjoy that. But what what's unique about the character, we feel, is the experience that people have here. There's um, something special about the way it brings people together from backgrounds very diverse backgrounds, different nationalities, people on Route 66, United States uh, travelers, people literally from every country on the globe come together here. They sit out, they relax, they tell stories. We may have a campfire and roast a few marshmallows, teach people how to make a s'more. And people relax, they drop their guard, They share their stories. They become friends. And that is a unique experience in lodging. And if you stay in a chain hotel, you may not even look at your neighbor, (laughs) let alone, you know, sit down and have a conversation with them. Uh, Here, people tend to drop their guard. We have some kind of guidelines that we always say. We don't talk about politics, race religion, uh, sexual orientation, we all that stuff is outside of our happy little bubble here, and we all get along. And that, that is a, something that we, we didn't expect, but that seems to happen natural, naturally here. People relax, enjoy the atmosphere, love to sit out in the evenings soaking up the, the glow of the neon, and then um, they leave in the morning as friends. A true Route 66 experience. Now, Kevin, when I was there, I parked my car in the garage adjacent to the room. Tell us about Uh the murals in the garage. Well, uh, there were some murals here when we we got here. We've added some new ones. We have tended to – there are a lot of murals in Tucumcari, almost 40, uh, and it it is really a special thing, and lots of communities have great murals along the route. So – um, we did kind of decide that uh, there were some murals on the outside of the building, which we didn't care for as much as a historic property. We thought they didn't belong there. And so we've, as they've deteriorated, we've eliminated a few on the exterior. But the ones that are in the garages, we feel that uh, because they can be hidden easily by just putting the garage door down, they don't take away from the historic character of the of the motel. Um, so we have um, some because uh, the Blue Swallow served as part of the inspiration for the Cozy Cone Motel in the movie Cars. We have some of the Cars characters in one of the garages. We have another garage that has a Route 66. Um, theme to it from a popular movie that some people know, um, motorcycle trip on routes uh, that was partially on Route 66, known as Easy Rider. There's a mural about Tucumcari's Neon Pass that one of our friends 
Emily Pretty has painted. It's just gorgeous neon signs that aren't in the town anymore uh, from motels of the past. It's just beautifully done. And then there's a uh, another great mural that features uh, replicas of artwork of uh, Bob Waldmeyer, who is a well-known uh, artist and promoter of Route 66 back before it became the phenomenon that it is today. Kevin, what's one thing you wish you knew before getting into the hospitality business on Route 66? Well, uh, <laughs> I think had we had a, a little bit more awareness of the the draw that the the place that we had purchased was going to be, we were a little overwhelmed by that initially. It still could be overwhelming. That would have helped us uh, kind of um, brace ourselves a little bit, if you will. We, <laughs> at one point, our first summer as business picked up, and it did, uh, it did quite a bit towards the end of that first summer. I can remember standing outside a mix a mis- amidst the chaos that we refer to as happy chaos here at the Blue Swallow. And I said to my wife, I said, I hope we don't become victims of our own success. And uh, it's re- it, it really was very overwhelming to us uh, and far beyond our expectation. Uh, it didn't really have anything to do with the actual hospitality business per se, because we don't find that part of it difficult. We treat our guests like their family, and we hope that they leave as friends, and that's pretty natural. But the responsibility that we felt and the overwhelming, almost uh, pressure of the responsibility of, of um, keeping up a place like this under that much attention that was that. Like I said, that was kind of overwhelming. Had we known a little bit more of that uh, about that, we would have we would have prepared ourselves better, I think. But it's all gone well. We couldn't ask for it to be any better. We've had so much wonderful support from people all over the world. It's it really has been a, an amazing experience for us. So, what is a typical day like at the height of the tourism season for you and Nancy and your son Cameron? <laughs> well, we start out uh, when we open up our lobby in the morning. Things usually go get busy right off the bat with our guests um, coming in for their morning coffee. We don't have coffee makers in the rooms. We have it in the lobby. We serve it in our real blue swallow mugs, which have become favorites uh, of travelers. And there's a lot of conversation uh, about people's trips. People are asking for recommendations of where they should go next, what should they see. They talk to each other. Um, and as people began to get back on the road, we we are in the process as quickly as possible of trying to turn the place over and get it ready for the next night because we're going to be busy again. And that that's a big deal. We try to get it all done as quickly as we can so that we have a we, – we open in the afternoon for check-in starting at 3. If we can get done by 12.30 or 1 o'clock, we have a couple of hours to, to take a break, uh, catch our breath, maybe a short nap, uh, have something to eat, and then get ready to welcome our next guests in. And we may go until – uh, between nine and ten o'clock, depending on the group and the um, who's here and uh, whether we have a campfire or not, so it's it's a very busy busy day. the The other thing is, especially for um, my son and I over the years, uh, Nancy is kind of oversees the the housekeeping areas and will take care of any maintenance needs that need to be done uh, if it's fixing a leaky faucet or. Uh, rehanging a blind that fell down, or whatever whatever maintenance needs are there, we uh, we address those. Now, Kevin, I believe when I was there, you had a picture in the lobby of Lillian Redmond. Tell us who she was and the history of the Blue Swallow with her. Well, Lillian Redmond. If it wasn't for Lillian Redmond, I think it's pretty safe to say that the Blue Swallow would be nothing but a 
either a vacant lot or a crumbling remnant like many other places are without a without a, a champion if you will places just didn't survive and Lillian came here in the mid 50s we don't know exactly when she arrived but we're quite sure that she was a manager of the place initially she met a man named Floyd Redman or he met her he was kind of a mover and shaker of Tucum Carey and they hit it off and uh, when they decided to get married he bought the motel as it, and gave it to Lillian as a an engagement present <laughs> and uh, quite a pre- quite a present it was it, it became her passion and her life really the rest of her life this was this was it for her and she had a reputation for hospitality for and for doing whatever she needed to do to keep her motel, her love, her passion going. And she did it in, in very difficult times. Uh, when she first came here, Route 66 was in its heyday, and it was boom times. But in the 60s, you had um, new hotels being built built out along Route 66. The interstate didn't get finished to Texas from here until 1980. And before that, we had Holiday Inns built, we had a Ramada, we had a Sheraton, we had other modern, uh, larger, fancier hotels. The, the motor courts like this began to die off. Many closed before Route 66 even came through to Comcary. And uh, she managed to keep the motel open and operating. She didn't make a lot of money, but she kept it going. And uh, if it hadn't been for her and her dedication to the place, uh, it, it definitely would not have survived. Yeah, she didn't make a lot of money. She kept the place going. And is it true that she actually would give guests the rooms if they didn't have any money? That's the story. Uh, we... We have, you know, she was known for doing, uh, treating people uh, like family. And if there was somebody who was struggling, she would she would exchange if, if furniture. Uh, she would take work from from some people uh, in exchange for accommodations. Um, but she would she would take care of people, um, but she was tough too, um, and you had to be tough to survive those difficult times. Uh, she was interviewed in uh, I think 1983 uh, by National Geographic magazine. She was interviewed about the impact of the interstates on small towns in America, and she told the story about how the Route 66 in Tucumcari Carey had been had bypassed her, and how sad it was that uh, she'd lost her connection to her travelers. But the color photograph of her with the neon sign over her shoulder really put this place on the map. I think for the first time nationally. Absolutely, and I'll have links at the Route 66 Podcast dot com. She did it right up until the late 80s, right before she died. Correct. Uh, actually, it was 1997, I think, um, late 97, when it was her health was so bad that she was unable to to continue. She died in uh, February of 1999. But she was in her late 80s, correct? How old was she? She was, yeah, she was an almost 90. She was 89 years old. Wow, <laughs> incredible! And, and she was she was in pretty poor health. We've heard some interesting stories from um, from people. Uh, locals and from travelers. One one story was she was unable near the end to get up into the rooms, and sometimes she didn't have help to clean the rooms, and so she would ask her guests, <laughs> if you'd please tidy up uh, before you leave. Uh, can you imagine us doing that now? Would you please clean up your room because there's more people going to be there in there tonight? <laughs> and I've seen pictures of her in a wheelchair in her later years up there. Yeah, she wasn't she wasn't uh, getting around very very well. She was definitely not able to get into the rooms. There's a, a, another funny story about about her, just a brief one that a local told us. Uh, I told you that she used to do whatever she could 
to make some money, to keep the doors open. One of the things that she did back in the days when you could not buy beer, alcohol, on Sunday in Tucumcari, uh, but you could find it at the Blue Swallow Motel. <laughs> <laughs> and locals knew that, and so they would come and buy a six-pack from Lillian. Now, she charged a premium price for that, but uh, I think that's the one way she made a little extra revenue. <laughs> Kevin, why the Blue Swallow? What's the meaning behind the name, the Blue Swallow? Well, the, uh, the Swallows have a history of, of symbolism for travelers. Sailors would tattoo Swallows on their, on their bodies if, as a sign of a, a, a hope for a safe journey. Uh, swallows have symbolism for always returning home, like the Swallows of Capistrano, uh, they have a life, they mate for life, so they're a symbol of love and commitment. And all those, I think, are a good reason for a place to be named after a swallow. The blue swallow is a variety of swallow, and there are a lot of them around here, and you will see their nests um, under freeway overpasses and on buildings. We've had swallows a couple of seasons here at the Blue Swallow, actually, on the premises, and that was very exciting. So uh, it, it was, I, w- I believe it, we believe it was named that because of the, the symbolism uh, of the Swallow for travelers. Kevin, who are some of the more memorable guests that you could tell us about? Well, we've had, a, it's, we've had some great guests. We have our regulars who come frequently several times a year and it's always a a pleasure to welcome them Uh, we've had some interesting characters who left us uh, surprises when they left and one particularly that comes to mind this guy was kind of a uh, he was a joker a bit and we had fun talking to him and in the morning when he left uh, our housekeeper went to go into the room, and when she opened the door, we heard her scream. <laughs> what was it? He had made, he had created a mummy out of the bedding and laid it on the bed. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so it looked like a body laying there, and it caught our housekeeper totally by surprise. It was, it was the funniest thing that we'd ever seen. It was incredible. So uh, that was one of the most memorable things we've had. We've had a few... Uh, well-known people, some musicians, some Hollywood performers, uh, and and that's always interesting. Uh, but quite honestly, they're they're looking for the same thing that other people are looking for, and we find that they're just regular people, just like everybody else. And we we enjoy each and every one of our guests. We just get the greatest people here, um, and we've made friends with so many of them from all over the world. Now, have you seen the Bob Dylan collection where he did paintings along Route 66, including the sign to the Blue Swallow? (laughs) Yes, yes, we have. Unfortunately, apparently Bob uh, has never been here before, but he did a good job on the painting. It's beautiful. So it's taken from a picture, then? He didn't actually stay there? Yeah, there's a photograph... um, that he must have been looking at, that uh, if you Google search the Blue Swallow, you can find the picture that it looks like he based his painting on. Um, But that doesn't take anything away from it. Hopefully one day he'll be here. Now, I know you've put a lot of work into that neon sign. Tell us how much is involved just in maintaining it, especially in today's world. Well, maintaining neon is really not that difficult. Uh, It's a matter of making sure you have a good transformer, you have good wire, you have glass that's not broken, um, you'll have light. And it's long-lasting. We have a lot of it here. We have two signs. We We have a replica of the original 1939 sign. We have the main sign out front, which was put up in the mid-50s. We have hundreds of feet of neon around the motel rooms and around the lobby building. We have a blue swallow on the wall above each pair of garages. Um, it's It's a lot of glass and a lot of wire and a lot of transformers. So 
we spent a lot of time early on. Uh, we had issues with the sign, replacing transformers, replacing wiring. Um, the first summer we were here, it seemed like, well, the first month we were here, my wife will tell you that it would seem like every night I would flip the switch to turn the sign on and something wouldn't be working. And I spent a lot of time up there on hot summer evenings trying to get it to light up because it's, uh, it's kind of become a sense of uh, a real, uh, have a lot of pride in keeping it lighted so that people who take pictures don't get a bad picture. So we don't want the sign to be partially lighted. So that, that summer was really hot, the hottest summer we'd had. And if you've ever seen the bridge on the River Kwai, you know that Alec Guinness used to get put in the hot box as punishment. And that's a lot how it felt to be inside the sign when it was 105 degrees outside. It had to have been 140 or 150 inside the sign, and I'm replacing wiring, replacing the transformer. It's a lot more reliable now, and I don't have as many many problems with it. Now, I have it's a T-shirt some- I wear here in New Jersey from the uh, Blue Swallow, and on the back it has 100% refrigerated air. What was yeah. the reference, Kevin, of that in the movie Cars? Well, the, uh, that, that whole uh, refrigerated air idea was a way of describing mechanical refrigeration to travelers in the 30s and 40s who had never experienced anything like that before. So they knew the difference between a swamp cooler or a fan <laughs> in the window. And uh, it became, now it's quaint, the uh, refrigerated air, but they did use the green neon 100% refrigerated air slogan on the Cozy Cone Motel. If you watch cars, you will see Below the main sign, a uh, neon sign at the Cozy Cone, an, an oval with the, in the same style lettering in green neon, 100% refrigerated air. Sally runs a, a, a good place at the Cozy Cone. And I don't know if you heard my past episode with Dawn Welsh of the Rock Cafe. She tells <laughs> yeah. the story about when Michael Wallace came with the Pixar crew, she was trying to get her sign to work. And it yeah. wasn't working consistently, so what she did was she'd have to flip the switch and it would go on for a split second, then shut off. And it was ironic that she said in the movie Cars, there's a split second where she turns on the sign and it goes out. Uh-huh. And unless you knew that story, you'd be like, why did they even put that in the movie that the sign went out one, two, three? They were very clever about incorporating things that they learned along the road and and uh, architecture from the uh, the road and it, it's it's a, it's a wonderful movie that has introduced a whole uh, is new generation couple, absolutely to Route 66. Now, Kevin, do you and Nancy network with other historic Route 66 motels along the road? We we certainly do. When we have a chance to travel, we we try to always stay with in the vintage places so that we get to know them we get to know the owners connie you mentioned connie at the beginning of the podcast uh connie eccles at the wagon wheel she was our our real first experience with a vintage motel on route 66 oh okay and and when we came out to buy the place or to look at it uh, when we came out in 2007, it wasn't open and serving travelers, and that was before Connie bought it. In 2011, that was our our first exciting Route 66 overnight stop, and Connie was in the late stages of her restoration. And we had a lot of questions because we were just kind of trying to find out more about the business and what she was doing. We asked a lot of questions about her towels, her soaps, her mattresses, her everything. And she um, she uh, got a, a nickname for us. She began calling us the nosy people. <laughs> <laughs> In a good way. In a good way. Uh, we, we, we didn't want to tell people because the owner of the Blue Swallow didn't want us advertising the fact that we were uh, – potential buyers and so we didn't tell people what we were doing we were just traveling route 66 so she couldn't understand why we had so many questions about the motel business uh we actually stayed with her twice on that trip 
on our way back as well and uh, had even more questions. But at that time, uh, we, and we weren't still able to tell Connie what we were doing until we were finally moving back in June of 2011 to take over the motel. We were able to actually tell her that we had bought the Blue Swallow and we were on our way to take over. Well, that explains a lot. She's, you know, she's she figured that. it out. Yes, yeah. Connie was she my was guest on episode number 19. She's from The Wagon Wheel, which was another great episode. We've also stayed with Ramona at the Munger Moss and uh, become friends with her. We've, we've stayed at, uh, you know, at, as many places along the route as we can. So we get to know the owners, we get to know the property, and we know who we can, uh, that when we recommend a place to our guests, if they say, well, where should we stay when we go to Holbrook or uh, we're going to be in Cuba, where should we stay? Or um, what's, the, what's the Wigwam Motel like in uh, in um, San Bernardino, uh, we can tell them from our personal experience. And uh, they do the same thing with us. We share rack cards. Uh, we have cards from attractions. We try to share as much knowledge as we can. And it's all to to help each other out, but also to make the traveler's experience the best it can be all up and down the route. And now are there other historic motels in Tucumcari? There are several. Tucumcari is a unique town because, first of all, it had a lot of these kind of places. Even though the Blue Swallow is the oldest of the ones that's still operating in Tucumcari, there are several from the 50s and 60s. In fact, there are, there are four good ones, including the Blue Swallow. The Motel Safari, which was built in the 50s. The Roadrunner Lodge, which was built in the 60s the historic Route 66 motel built in the late 60s. They are all operated by, I guess you'd call them family businesses, and amazingly, out of 22 or 23 lodging establishments in Tucumcari, if you look at the ratings on TripAdvisor, for example, which a lot of people do, these four historic properties are rated first, second, third, and fourth. All the chain hotels are lower down the list. There's nothing like that, I don't think, in any other city in the country. Wow. Where you have historic mom-and-pop type motels that are ranked so highly by travelers. So it's, it's a unique town from that respect. When we, when we book up, we recommend one of these other guys. Our, we're friends with the owners. And, you know, we try to keep people in Tucumcari because we have great restaurants, great museums, um, all the murals, lots to see. And if they can't stay with us, we want them to stay uh, in, in town. And, and, and the other guys do the same thing. Now, Tucumcari, when I'm there, Tucumcari has other Route 66 landmarks, such as the Route 66 Monument. Um, the person who designed that was my guest here on episode number 11. Oh. It has murals. It has the Route 66 Museum with classic cars and a collection of Route 66 photographs. But on the other hand, I've seen a lot of vacant stores in Tucumcari. What goes through your mind, Kevin, when you drive down Main Street in Tucumcari and see all these vacant lots and stores? What goes through my mind is that there's still a lot of great opportunities here uh, for someone who wants to have a fun business on Route 66. Other towns have the same thing. Tucumcari has, you know, served travelers. It was hit hard by the interstate bypassing Route 66. It was hit hard losing industry in town. And it, it's been slow to recover, but there is a lot of opportunity. It's not an easy lifestyle to do what we do. Ask any of the motel owners. Uh, it's hard work. Not everybody wants to do that. Um, ask the owner of the, his, the TP Curios, which is a wonderful historic shop here that everybody wants to visit. It's, it's not an easy life, um, but there's great opportunity to live and work, meet people from all over the world, make a decent living, um, and, and still out there. Now, your son Cameron, who I've met, is married. He's a young man. He's a young man with an infant, with a child. Yes. Is 
handing Cameron and his wife the keys to the front door to continue the blue swato, swallow, a tradition with the Mueller family, something you hope to look forward to someday, or do you eventually hope to just move on to your next phase of retirement? <laughs> We, uh, it's likely that we'll move on to the next phase of our retirement. Cameron and Jessica were here with us for four and a half years. They are now back in the quote unquote real world. Um, and, uh, Nancy and I are on our own here for now. So, um, we knew we wouldn't have them here permanently. Jessica has strong family ties to her home in Kentucky. And, uh, so, uh, I will safely say that we could not have accomplished everything that we have have here without their help. Uh, it was a true team effort, uh, and I think a very special experience for them as well. Kevin, what is the most popular souvenir that you sell at the Blue Swallow? We have two. We sell a lot, uh, and we sell a variety, and everything that we have is Blue Swallow Motel specific. We don't infringe on other shops that sell Route 66 stuff because we want to provide unique uh, souvenirs for our guests and for travelers. The, the two most popular items, one is our Blue Swallow Motel 100% refrigerated air coffee mugs. People absolutely love them. And when they buy one, they take it home. We get photographs <laughs> from while they're having their morning coffee out on their patio or their deck or in their cozy kitchen. Um, they've really, it's really been amazing. We sell thousands of mugs. Um, it's it's quite it's been amazing. The other one that's really popular, we sell. Um, our room key tags, uh, which uh, just an easy souvenir for everybody to take. They stay in room 12, for example. They want to buy a key tag for room 12. They put it on their keychain, or maybe they have spare keys to the car or whatever, and they take home a little souvenir of the Blue Swallow. Even somebody on a motorcycle with limited space can pick up a key tag and take it home. And that is a fun, very vintage-looking souvenir that, that people really enjoy collecting. And there's a number of places uh, now that, that sell those along Route 66. And if you're running a business on Route 66, an accommodation, and you're not selling your key tags, you're missing out on an opportunity. People want to buy them. Absolutely. In fact, for our beach house down the Jersey Shore, I have a uh, Blue Swallow key tag from Room Thirteen, and I think I also bought sixty six. Okay. And I'm, and I'm always afraid when I give somebody the keys, they're going to lose the key tag. I don't care about the key for the place itself, but it's the key tag. The other benefit to sell, to selling them is that people are less inclined to take the one that has our actual key on it. <laughs> <laughs> so that must be a full time business right there with all of those coffee mugs that you're shipping out. Oh gosh, we just got an order in our order in for this summer, and hopefully we'll be able to get back to business as usual very soon. Uh, we just got a, a shipment of seventeen cases of coffee mugs, and uh, so if you would like a Blue Swallow coffee mug, you can go on our website at www.blueswallowmotel.com and our online gift shop and order one, and we'll be glad to ship it to you anywhere in the world. So, Kevin, before we say goodbye, what does Route sixty six mean to you? Route 66 has, uh, has meant for me a extremely rewarding experience that has, that has provided uh, friendships, a living, and a connection to history that um, can't be duplicated anywhere else. Uh, I wouldn't trade my experience here for anything. And Kevin, what's next on your bucket list? <laughs> well, I, I'm looking forward to doing some more traveling on Route 66 myself. <laughs> That's on my bucket list. I, I have never, I, I motorcycle, and so does my son. Uh, both my sons ride motorcycles, and we've never done end-to-end on our motorcycles. 
Uh, I envy the groups that do that, and uh, I would like to like to do that myself. And I I would love to participate with a group uh, helping the tour leader and do a motorcycle trip all the way across Route 66. Well, we're talking today with uh, Kevin Mueller, who's the owner of the historic Blue Swallow Motel in Tucumcari, New Mexico. Kevin, thank you so much for taking the time today to talk with us. It was a pleasure to be on. Thank you. Kevin, is there anything I uh, you want to mention before we say goodbye? Nothing I need to say except to everybody out there. Have a great Route 66 day. That was Kevin Mueller, owner of the Blue Swallow Motel, along with his wife, Nancy. We recorded that talk just at the beginning of the COVID-19 outbreak, and since that time, he had to temporarily close the motel until at least mid-May 2020. I encourage you to reach out to your favorite Route 66 stop and maybe order a t-shirt, or the Blue Swallow has all those coffee mugs, which are really a great conversational piece. I know the businesses up and down the route will certainly need our support. Thank you. And now our trivia question. Why was Keeley one of the most popular doctors of all time that nobody has ever heard of, even today? Well, in my talk with Dr. Hickman, he mentions that Keeley was often thought of as a quack in the medical field. And he mentions that even if treating patients with flex of gold in the day was suitable and not just a placebo, Keeley stepped his treatment plan very secret. And so that's why it's often called the secret gold cure. Well, we're going to continue with the blue theme here on the Route 66 podcast. Next time on the show, I have Blaine Davis, son of Hugh Davis, who constructed the blue whale to show his love for his wife. Blaine will be joined with Linda Hobbs, who runs the gift shop at the blue whale. Even if Hugh didn't construct the blue whale, I know you'll enjoy hear Blaine talk about what it was like growing up with a dad who ran the Tulsa Zoo back in the 1950s. Here's a clip of Blaine talking about his dad building the well. He had had to do something. Uh, He had to stay busy. My father was not one that would sit down and do nothing. He was not a rocking chair person. But what gave him the idea for a whale, uh, he had already built a lot of things, in that area, uh, the swimming hole. Uh, And the kids uh, always wanted something bigger. So he just decided one day, I'll fix that. And he started sketching on a piece of paper uh, what he wanted to do. And uh, he ended up uh, building the whale, which is a fairly good-sized project, He'd never done any concrete work before. The story goes that he gave it to my mother. They put one word in there that is not correct. You cannot give something like that as a surprise. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's obvious he's building it right in front of you. Uh, And she saw this going on. took two years to build it. And he, he said, you're the only woman in the world who has one of these. And here it is. Here's your whale. At that time, it was not blue yet. It was just natural concrete color. My mother was always interested in whales, although I do not believe that my mother ever actually saw a live whale. Of course, it's getting older. Uh, there's no swimming anymore. Uh, many things have taken care of that. Now, when it was in its heyday and it was a swimming hole, it was a lot different around here than it is now. I liked it better back when you could actually get in there and swim. Oh, and it's heyday, you would have 100 to 125 people there at the same time. There are pictures to that effect, and it was quite a fun spot. Crowds that size uh, were normal here during Uh, It's high day. Be sure to join me next time when Blaine Davis and Linda Hobbs will be my guests right here on the Route 66 podcast, talking all about the blue whale. Well, that's our show for now. Please be sure to visit our website 
Route 66 podcast and leave a short message on the homepage about your earliest Route 66 memory. I will be selecting one lucky person and sending them a Route 66 washable face mask. Let me tell you, I wear mine out in public, and it's like wearing your favorite Route 66 t-shirt. Every roadie has one, you know you do, and as you meet people, you see them staring at it and checking it out. Well, imagine the feeling for me. I live almost a thousand miles from the nearest point along Route 66. If you're not on a mailing list, please sign up on the website. I have a few exciting projects related to Route 66 coming up, especially now that I'm home, and you'll receive the latest announcement as they develop via email instead of waiting until the next episode. Remember, visit the website where I will be releasing daily video clips featuring Route 66 guests that I often share when giving presentations about the Mother Road. Thank you for taking the journey with us here on the Route 66 Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Arno. Be well.